This is a film about how the Holocaust has affected the lives of four people. Most textbooks just deal with facts and show pictures of Hitler and the death camps. But we wanted to make a film with individuals which showed their feelings and that they had families who were destroyed. The four survivors you will meet are Esther, Harry, Liesel and Werner. The other people in the film are 12 students from various schools on Tyneside. They got together a few times before meeting the survivors, but none of the questions were planned in advance. I was born 68 years ago in a provincial town in Germany and life was very normal before the Nazi came to power. I lived the life of an ordinary schoolboy, went to, public, to an ordinary school and I grew up as an ordinary German youth. The change only occurred when I was 12 years of age. Now, and and then the year 1933, I found suddenly that my people and I were turned into vermin. From there onwards, after the Nazi came to power, our life went sharply downhill from economic uh, oppression to humiliation. I was chased out of school when I was 14 years of age, and I went into a Jewish college. Just before my 16th birthday, our school was ransacked, destroyed in the so-called Kristallnacht, and I found myself in a concentration camp called Dachau. That was hell, but I survived, and it induced me to seek refuge in England. I came here 50 years ago and I have had 50 years to think through the events of those days. You know, how did you feel when the, the Nazis actually were in power? Scared, worried, disturbed, because I couldn't understand what crime I had committed. I was a traitor, a polluter, what have you. I felt outraged above all and frightened because there was nothing I could do to, to resist. Did your family become more united, more close? Yes, indeed, because we were driven in upon ourselves. We lost our non-Jewish contacts, so therefore the community was driven into itself, the family united because we knew we had to stay together because we were on the edge of being broken up, which happened in due course. And did you have any un-Jewish friends? And what was their reaction to it? Well, obviously we had Jewish friends. We had no others because non-Jewish Aryan boys and girls would not, couldn't afford the luxury of being called Jew lovers. So our company became more and more Jewish and we all felt the same. Above all, we all were worried about one thing. Where shall we go? Liesel, what we'd like to know is what you remember of your experiences before and during the Holocaust. I was born in, in Czechoslovakia in a family. I was, I was very well looked after and loved and I had a brother and um, life was good and then uh, the part where I lived was the Sudetenland so that's the part the Germans occupied first and we fled inland to to Prague and then the Germans occupied the whole of my country and at that time 
everyone was busy, all the Jewish people there were busy trying to get visas to get out. But my parents weren't able to do that. But there was a scheme available to allow children out under the age of 16. So I, I was able to get out in the last train that left Prague before the beginning of the war. Not my brother, he was too old. He was over 16. So I came to England and my parents said, see you soon. Um, and the bit in England, the, the bit during the war wasn't too bad. It, it, it was like being homesick and just marking time and waiting for the war to be over and go home again. And the real horror was when the war was over and I discovered that everybody I grew up with was dead. I did find my mother, and I'm saying I did find my mother because she was very changed. She wasn't the mother I had left. Um, and also, I remember our first meeting where she, who had lost her husband and her son and her parents and all her peers, was saying to me, you're the only one left to me to make life OK for me. And that was a colossal burden I couldn't manage. I wasn't aware of it at the time, but I knew I was, it's something I could never do. So our relationship was very different uh, when we met again. I left age 12 and we met again when I was 19. Well, I was born in Poland, in Łódź, which was the second largest city in Poland. And a third of the total population was Jewish, so I grew up with a strong awareness of being Jewish. Um, very much aware, though, of the hostile environment, because uh, I don't generalize, but one felt Poles were very anti-Semitic. But I had a very happy home life, and if you're a child and you're loved by your parents, you feel very secure. The main event, of course, I remember vividly the outbreak of war, and um, my town was invaded just a week after. And, of course, we were terrorized from the very beginning, the whole population, but the Jews in particular. So I do know that I was very scared, very frightened, at one point feeling a kind of childish excitement that it's going to be over soon and my won't there be a lot to talk about. The first very painful thing was for us as a family. My father had to flee our hometown. So the last time I've seen him was at the age of 11. Um, 1940, when we were all herded in to the ghetto and uh, in a small section of the part, the poorest town, the poorest part of the city, and we were something like 230,000 in that place, hermetically, you know, barbed off, and there was no way of escape. But I would say the most um, painful moments were the mass deportations, which started taking place in 41 and 42, where most of my friends were just disappearing. Most of them died of starvation and hunger. And then, of course, it was the uh, journey to Auschwitz when the ghetto was liquidated, the train journey, and um, separation from my mother. And, of course, although we had been under Nazi occupation for so long and suffered all the degradation, hunger, disease. We were not prepared for what Auschwitz was. And of course, this is the most painful moment, which I have never got over. But um, there were light moments in my life, you know, as a child. Life was very interesting and 
my parents were mixed up in a sort of kind of movement that was going to shape a new world and I grew up with a strong sense of love for everybody despite the fact that we were not being loved. I was wondering about when you were going to Auschwitz on the journey, whether you actually knew the situation that you were going into or whether you had been told that you were just going off on a holiday or... No, a... no one was told that was going off on a holiday. We were told that we were being, you know, sent to another place, Ibersiedlung, um, you know, another place of work. And uh, we were told to take things with us, like various utensils and so on. So, no, we were not aware, but uh, we didn't expect anything good because all the people who have been deported before were never heard of again. Dreadful things were happening in the Lutsch ghetto after 1942 when clothing started arriving back into the Lutsch ghetto, marked, you know, names and people who worked in various factories, like making um, carpets for the Germans from old rags found their relatives clothing so that left you wondering what could have actually been happening so no we didn't expect anything good but certainly didn't expect what was coming not at all and uh, when we did arrive the people who worked there at the railways they said you know Form and fives to me, they said, say you're older. And we said, where are we? Where are we? Where are we? You mean you don't know what this is? I said, no, we don't. And um, I had seen the barbed wire, and I had seen people that just looked very deranged. And we thought, well, that's not for us, because that looks like some kind of lunatic asylum, so that's not for us. Um, and then I, I just, from a distance, saw someone go towards the wire and fall. And I was told, well, you know, she's touched the electrified wire. She, she's dead now. It still did not somehow sink in. They even gave us on arrival um, a tin of something, you know, to eat while we were actually being pushed towards selection. So everything was uh, done in such a way that you, you couldn't think at all. You couldn't think at all. You were just pushed. And that was the reality. So never, um, I know now that one could possibly never imagine it not having it experienced. My name is Chaim Nagelstein. I was lived in a town called Rubieshof in Poland. And uh, when the Germans come in, like the, in our town, they stopped us going to, going to school and, and different things. And I li we lived there quite happily for about, when they come about two years. And after about two years, they started to dep getting deportation in groups of Jewish people. It's about 10,000 10, Jewish people lived in the town where we lived. And um, so we started deportation. We were about three, three group, three parts every every afternoon, every two or three. Weeks. And then uh, and we were the last ones. Like so, my mother and father and my brothers. I had uh, three brothers and four sisters. Mother and father, nine of nine of us now. Uh, went into hiding. They hide themselves in the in the cellar in the house. So my sister and I and a boyfriend. We didn't want to go down the cellar, so somebody had to be upstairs in any case to cover the the uh, the lid of the over the foot was in the, in the cellar, and we put the lid down and put a bed over it so nobody could see where this actually this entrance to the cellar is. So and then we ran away to a farmer and we hid ourselves in the in a haystack. The haystack was specially. Uh, hollowed out inside with timber so we could live there. There was ten of us living with my sister's boyfriend's mother and father and their, their children they stayed there and uh, we stayed there for two weeks. And they decided they've had enough in that haystack and they went out to another village they went and it was just the three of us left, my, my sister, myself and a boyfriend. 
And so the, far, and the farmer used to come each evening and put the food down and milk beside the haystack and we used to go come out and get it. And we couldn't de- go out up the, through the day, so even in the evenings, if I wanted to go out to use the toilet, we'd have to all be in the evenings come out to the haystack to use the toilet out. So, so um, then we uh, we gave ourselves up because there was only three of us within the farmer come and said he saw some young people in in the town uh, doing work and walking down in the houses, clearing all the houses out, the Jewish houses. So I come and my my sister and boyfriend gave us a book to the Gestapo and we said, uh, we asked us where we were, we said we were just hiding in the fee, in the in the in the woods. Is there any chance can we work here or something? They said, okay, so we put us in this Jewish ghetto, There's about 250 people were. And we cleared all the Jewish belongings out from all the all the houses, Jewish houses. And uh, that was about after about three months. And then after three months, the Gestapo surrounded over that little ghetto with about 250 people, and it took half of us away. My sister was another half still staying, and I was taken away to a, a place, a concentration called uh, Majdanek. That was my first concentration camp, Majdanek. And after about four or five weeks there, uh, the the assessor would come around and ask me if anybody's uh, builders or joiners. They need uh, about 80 people to go out to work somewhere. So my father in Poland was a builder, and I was only young. Because when I went into the country, I gave me three years, three years older. I was actually 14, but I gave him three years. So when if you're a bit older, they put you to work. You see? So. Uh, and uh, so I put my hand up, saying that I'm a Mauro, my father was a builder and all this sort of thing. And he said, oh, yes, and he said, so much, how much bricks can lay this? And I said, oh. so he said, oh, you are, you are a builder, so right, you go on here. And we went out and we worked in a place called Zamos. We built a factory, or pickled factory, pickled onions, cucumbers, cabbage, all this sort of thing. We built this factory. And um, uh, from, uh, so about, we were there about six or seven months, and then the, after the fa- when the, once the factory was finished, well, Maidani concentration camps was liquidated. They, they killed everybody in that camp. They burned and gassed the whole camp. They didn't bring any more uh, prisoners to that camp. They just liquidated the whole concentration camp. So we were we belonged to Maidani because we were just hired out to this uh, working camp. So there was an order come to the town where we were working that they got to finish us, not to bring us back to Maidan because there's no more Maidanic, so they got to kill us, the 80 people, the 80 workers. So there was one Gestapo, they said, they're such a good workers, they're going to kill, they had good, they built this factory, wonderful job they made. So there was a place out not far from where we built, an uh, airfield, and there was about 1,200 uh, Jewish people working there. So the we didn't know where we were going. We got two, two and two trucks, put us in the two trucks, went down to this airfield, and they sh- exchanged for 80 people from there. They let us go to work in that airfield, and they took 80 people away to a Jewish summit, and they shot them. And then they could turn around and say to Maidanik, where the concentration camp was, that they killed us. When Hitler came to power, in 1933, what were your immediate reactions to it? Well, remember, I was uh, 12 years of age, so my immediate reactions were a bit, little bit immature. But let me say this, my father thought it was a very good show, because Hitler, after all, was a empty-brained, loud, loud-mouthed demagogue, and it was about time for Hitler to be given the responsibility so that he would be shown up to be what he was, that he could not solve Germany's problems. But then my father was not a political either. My, he was proved wrong. My reactions were very worried, we didn't like it, but the main thing also occurs, we always had that optimism. It can't last. The French, the British, the Americans, the League of Nations, anybody, somebody will come to our rescue I don't know, but they didn't. Yeah, when um, when Hitler was voted into Parliament, did you think, uh, could you have thought that he could have done what he did? No, and the whole thing is, this is something that we have to consider. 
Hitler wrote a piece of co political garbage called Mein Kampf. It was economic and political nonsense that everybody knew it to be so. And having said that, he kept his promise. Could you go into more detail on why your father had to leave? Yes, my father had to leave because he was an active member of a Jewish socialist organization, which was very, very strong in Poland. The name of the organization was Bund, and uh, he was very active, and there were, his name appeared in lots of papers, town hall and so on. My uncle, who was a correspondent for a socialist newspaper, was arrested within three weeks of the Germans entering town. And my father was simply advised to leave for his safety. And we were going to follow, and we actually attempted to follow, and, uh, but we had to return at that time. The Germans were all over. We tried, obviously, to, to flee, but as non-Jews and um, people were returning, and saying, you know, they're taking everyone, you just can't make it. So we didn't. Um, what did you actually believe was happening to your parents and your family when you were in England? Have any idea? I hadn't a clue. I, I had letters for a little while via the Red Cross through Portugal, I think, and then everything stopped. And I, well, I didn't know. I just assumed they were having some sort of bad time and I'd see them when the war ended. I, I assumed throughout the war they were okay. And it was just a, a time of separation. But I had to weather out and they had to weather out. I don't, I don't, I, I didn't know, we didn't know. But now it turns out Churchill knew very well what was going on during the war, but um, not I. Hmm. It took me a long time to face all that period emotionally. And when I did, um, the first feeling I had was a kind of a betrayal. I'd got sent away and they said, see you soon. Especially with my father. I was a sort of daddy's girl. See you soon. Some sort of betrayal 